Converting ships can take many different shapes and forms. From taking a freighter and stapling a flight deck on top, to turning an ocean liner into a merchant cruiser. Generally though, these are going to be done for combat roles. Even if it's an originally civilian ship, being shifted to war duty. Today's video will look at two examples that are a bit more unique in this regard. Two ships taken in for conversion with absolutely no intention of combat duty. Instead, they were built entirely to train a future generation of aviators. A critically important and often underappreciated task. Although the ships themselves have become rather more famous in the modern day. These ships, USS Sable and USS Wolverine, are quite special after all. Their story originated with the outbreak of the Second World War for the United States. With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Navy was suddenly forced to heavily rely on its aircraft carriers. This wasn't an inherently bad thing, as these would become the new Queens of the Sea. However, it created a quandary. In the peacetime Navy, the final qualification for carrier pilots took place on the aircraft carriers. While specially painted runways on land could do most of the training, there was nothing that could replace real experience on a flat top. From Langley to the Lexingtons to Ranger, these ships trained their pilots even as they served as active warships. But with the battle fleet a flaming ruin, the Navy needed all its carriers on the front line. None of the ships could be spared for training duty, and this problem only grew worse as losses began to add up. Lexington, Yorktown, Wasp, Hornet. The Navy was running out of carriers, so even Ranger was pressed into action in the Atlantic. At this point, the easiest option, other than doing entirely land-based training, would have been escort carriers. These small and slow merchant conversions, or ships based on merchant hulls, would have been perfectly sufficient for training duty. A tad small, perhaps, but usable. If not for multiple submarine scares in both the Pacific and the German raids along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. A safer training area was needed, and the escort carriers were better put to use as convoy escorts and other such things. It was at this point that the Navy looked to the Great Lakes. Large, safe, and secure bodies of water perfect for training. One commander Richard Whitehead had, evidently, suggested it in early 1941, well before Pearl Harbor. In the aftermath of that attack, the idea came back up and was hastily embraced. At this point, the Navy could have done two things. A purpose-designed and built ship could have been ordered, but that idea was dropped pretty quickly because it would have been expensive and used up resources needed for other projects. Instead, a Great Lakes steamer was acquired. Converting one of these ships would be cheaper, it would be faster, and it wouldn't require an entirely new ship built from scratch. As all the ships would have to do was steam about, landing and launching aircraft, that wasn't an issue. As such, the passenger liner C and B was requisitioned on March 12, 1942, for $756,500, or something like $14 million in 2023 money. This was a coal-burning, side-wheel steamer. Not exactly the kind of thing you expect to become an aircraft carrier. The ship picked up an IX designation at this point, which was the Navy's designation for miscellaneous ships. In this case, IX-64. C&B's superstructure was cut off in Cleveland, before the rest of the ship was towed off to Buffalo for the remainder of the refit. Beginning in May of 1942, this entailed fitting a 500-foot-long wooden flight deck, along with a small island superstructure and arresting gears, with the funnel exhaust routed to the island on the starboard side. All of these modifications were intended to turn C and B into an admittedly small aircraft carrier. Displacing only about 7,300 tons, which is on the smaller end even compared to escort carriers. With no dry dock large enough to do the work, this was done with C and B afloat the entire time. The process went about as quick as it could have, only taking from May to August of 1942. Specifically with the new name of USS Wolverine, 
the training carrier was commissioned on August 12th of 1942. After training and sea trials, Wolverine set about her new task in January 1943. Stationed in Chicago, she sailed almost daily up and down Lake Michigan. Pilots would take off from a land-based airfield, fly out to Wolverine, and practice landings. Upon landing, they would then take off and return ashore, in the process learning how to operate on an aircraft carrier deck. That is not to say this was an easy task. Wolverine's 500-foot deck was on the smaller end, being slightly shorter than an Independence, and also quite a bit lower down and closer to the water. While this meant that any pilot that could land on her was fully capable of landing on an Essex, it didn't make the initial task any easier. Moreover, the Great Lakes were typically either flat calm, or oh god, I'm going to die, and not much in between. Good for merchant traffic on the calm days, much less good for flight training. Both landing and taking off required a headwind for proper operations. On the ocean, this was relatively easy to achieve. On a calm day in Lake Michigan, it was far more difficult. There were times when Wolverine couldn't operate for several days at a time, simply because the weather was too nice. Not helped by the fact she was a coal-burning paddle steamer. The power plant she inherited from her C&B days was only rated at 12,000 indicated horsepower for a maximum speed of 19 or so knots. That made the ship largely unable to generate her own headwind, unlike a 30-knot fleet carrier. Even one of those would have some issues in a flat calm, let alone something as slow as Wolverine. Nonetheless, Wolverine performed her duty well. She lacked a hangar deck, elevators, or any of the other combat-related equipment of a proper carrier. The ship really was a floating flight deck, and not much else. That being said, it was all she needed to be. She performed her role admirably, as the Navy converted a second, similar liner to the same task. That ship, Greater Buffalo, was newer than C&B had been. Greater Buffalo had entered service in 1925, while C&B dated back to 1913. Slightly larger as well at 518 feet, Greater Buffalo was a tad slower at 18 knots. In broad strokes, though, she was roughly equivalent to the other steamer right down to the same coal-fired, side-wheel propulsion. The Navy acquired Greater Buffalo right around the time Wolverine was entering service, on August 7, 1942. Her refit would prove to be more extensive than the older vessel, seeing a steel flight deck instead of a wooden one, among other things, such as being fully equipped to support both her crew and the pilots. A sick bay, laundry, tailor, and cafeteria-style galley being some distinct crew comfort features. For the pilots, the newly renamed USS Sable, IX-81, also carried a lecture room and bunks for 21 pilots, presumably for if they needed to stay aboard the ship for any reason. Like, for example, damaged aircraft. Just like Wolverine, however, she lacked any sort of hangar or elevator. Sable's aviation equipment was limited to her steel deck and eight arresting cables. Her displacement was similar as well, at around 6,900 tons. Sable was also fitted with a starboard side island, with her exhaust trunk through funnels and the superstructure. Entering service in May of 1943, Sable joined up with her cousin. Her crew was partly made up of survivors from USS Lexington, sunk during the Battle of the Coral Sea. I'm sure those men had quite an adjustment to make, going from the largest aircraft carrier in the world to one of the smallest, puttering about on a great lake. In any case, Wolverine and Sable, both operating out of Chicago, would spend the rest of the war on near-constant training duty. The only breaks the ships took, other than short refits, were down to weather. As said before, either because it was too calm or too rough. In this service, Wolverine was mostly used for typical flight training. Her slightly smaller wooden deck wasn't fit for experimental roles in the same way Sable was. With a 535-foot long flight deck, Sable could manage planes a tad bit better. In addition to that, the steel deck was used to test various kinds of non-skid coatings 
as part of her more experimental role. That said, the most famous experiment Sable took part in was operating experimental drone aircraft in August of 1943. These were the TDN-1, and Sable was the first ship they operated off of. Both for purposes of secrecy, and simply because it was easier to operate inland, than test them out to sea. It did provide some interesting pictures, as seen here, in the modern day. These stubby little drones were an early attempt at what would become your Predators and Bioroctars in modern combat operations. Not well known outside aviation enthusiast circles, but still quite important to drone development. This duty aside, however, both Sable and Wolverine were still mostly used for the training of pilots. Every plane in the Navy's arsenal, from old Vindicators to modern Corsairs and Avengers, would grace their stately flight decks. Even the venerable North American Texan would be used from time to time. I imagine pilots had issues with the thick black coal smoke, but they still managed. Although accidents were still common because these were trainee pilots. There's quite a few pictures of planes sticking tail up as they hit a barrier or otherwise pitched up on landing. And somewhere around 150 planes would eventually end up in the waters of Lake Michigan after failing to land. These accidents were still valuable learning material in their own right, however. Lacking proper aviation facilities, the crashed aircraft had to be manhandled to safety and repaired with limited resources. The deck crew were trained just as much as pilots in this regard. Accidents and experiments aside, Wolverine and Sable were successful in their duty. Somewhere around 18,000 pilots qualified on their decks in around 116,000 landings. One of these pilots, training on Sable, was the future president George H.W. Bush. However, as the war wrapped up in 1945, so too did the service of the coal-burning side-wheel training carriers. Sable and Wolverine were both decommissioned in November of 1945, with their role reverting to the glut of war-built aircraft carriers. Wolverine would be fairly quickly sold for scrap after an attempt to sell her back to merchant service. On the other hand, Sable was initially up to become a museum ship. The Great Lakes Historical Society tried, and failed, to secure Sable for a museum. This fell through, and she would be scrapped in 1948. Wolverine had preceded her, being sold for scrap at the end of 1947. The legacy of these ships cannot be understated. The pilots they trained received the kind of training that other navies could only dream of. Were they perfect? No, but they gave practical experience in carrier operations at a time when the proper aircraft carriers were unavailable. As it was said, if a pilot could land on these small coal belchers, they could land on anything. Although an enduring legacy remains in the pilots and planes that couldn't land on them. Those 100-odd aircraft on the bottom of Lake Michigan are some of the best preserved of their kind. Off and on recovery operations have pulled some up, but quite a few remain as potential museum pieces. One particular SPD Dauntless that failed to land on Sable in 1943 was pulled from the lake in 1994 and restored. This plane is now at the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida. What makes this particular Dauntless special is that it was a Battle of Midway veteran aircraft and I can't think of any other such planes off the top of my head. Multiple planes lost in that lake are, incidentally, combat veterans pulled back as newer aircraft replaced them. A treasure trove in a lot of ways. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.